Uh, if you brought a Bible today, I want you to open it to Acts, the tail end of chapter 7, the very, almost the last verse of Acts chapter 7. Uh, we're going to learn about a man named Saul today. Uh, this is the third in a series of messages entitled My Story, and my story is about, you guessed it, your story, and my story, and of course, God's story. The real question, the real interesting part of this whole idea is that our story, as insignificant as it may seem, as insignificant as you may feel, according to God's word, is interwoven with God's overarching eternal story. And one of the things that you're going to hear about, and you just heard about it from Laura, as people share their stories, you're going to hear stories of transformation, transforming from one thing to another. Now, every parent in the room gets this idea because your little hellions at home, you're constantly trying to transform them into better human beings, are you not? If your child has a problem telling the truth, you're trying to instill in that child a respect for honesty and integrity. My wife, Amy, as you know, is the children's director at this church, and every Sunday she comes home with incredible stories about your kids. I mean, they keep me entertained for hours. Last Sunday she came home and she said, Michael, today we played a game. It was kind of a mixture between Simon Says and musical chairs. Uh, the kids were kind of walking around in a circle, and I gave them a special signal. I told them, when I touch my head, you have to sit down. And so I explained the rules of the game, and at first I touched my shoulders, and then I touched my hips, and then I touched my knees, and finally I touched my head, and they sat down. I played the game several times over, and so we decided to change the special signal. So I asked the boys and girls, these are like first through third graders, I said, what special part of my body do you want me to touch for the special signal? And one of your little boys shouted out, boobies. <laughs> she said, I ignored it completely. I pretended it didn't happen. All of my helpers were biting their lip trying to keep from laughing. But this kid wouldn't stop. He said it again and again and again. Now, I'm not going to tell you whose child that was, but if you're concerned and you've got a little hunch, I'll meet you after the service and we'll talk. You cannot read the story of Jesus Christ, the resurrection, and the revolution that followed from the book of Acts without noticing the transitions, the transformations. Times were changing and people were changing. God, of course, had not changed but the way he revealed himself to his people had. Important to understanding the book of Acts, and last time I challenged you to read through the book of Acts over the next several weeks because I'm going to take you through it, not chapter by chapter, but story by story. Times were changing, people were changing, God's way of revealing himself to humankind was changing. In fact, Luke either directly identifies or at least records several very meaningful transitions uh, in the story. One is from the ministry of Jesus to the ministry of the apostles, because Jesus has ascended to the Father, and now the apostles have authority in the church. There's a transition from the Old Covenant or the Old Testament to the New, from Israel as God's primary witness in the world to the church as God's primary witness, from the dispensation of law to the dispensation of grace, that is the old covenant versus the new covenant, a different way of saying it, and from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God's presence on someone, to God's Spirit indwelling every follower of Jesus Christ. Now here's what I want everybody to understand as we get this started. Your story is personal to you, very personal, I'm sure. My story is very personal to me. And it doesn't matter if your story differs from mine in some way. God used what would speak loudest to me in order to write my story. He does the same for you. He speaks what, or He uses what speaks loudest to you in order to write yours. Now, last time we noted that fundamental, foundational to the Christian faith is the story of Jesus. And the story of Jesus is primarily comprised of two things. 
his resurrection, and then his promise to empower the church. You see, that's one of the things that makes your story significant is because if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it's attached to his overall eternal story. By recording Christ's appearances to hundreds of people throughout the New Testament, the New Testament leaves no doubt as to the authenticity of the resurrection and Christ's promise to empower the church. The New Testament is built on those two events. Jesus Christ was dead on Friday, and then he was alive on Sunday, and he promised to give life to his followers. That's what makes our story significant. We're part of his overall eternal story. Your story matters because it's personal. That's why, it's, that's why it means something to you. It's personal to you, and it doesn't necessarily have to look like mine. You see, adults rarely ever become followers of Jesus Christ because somebody steps in and answers all their questions. That's not why people buy in. People don't buy into faith in Jesus Christ because they've had all their obstacles removed, all their problems solved. That's not why they embrace authentic faith in Jesus Christ. There are many examples in the Bible of followers of Christ, pursuers of God, who still pursued regardless of their reservations. Moses had reservations. Abraham had reservations. In the New Testament, Nicodemus had reservations. Nathaniel had reservations. Thomas had reservations. And today, we're going to learn about Saul and his reservations. Now look, I get that you have reservations. I think everybody has reservations on some level. Even if you've been following Christ for a long time, that doesn't necessarily mean that somehow God has supernaturally answered all of your questions. He's certainly not solved all of your problems. You will not hear one person over the course of this series stand behind this table and say, I bought into faith in Jesus because he answered all my questions. You see, that's not how the process works. Uh, I'm not standing here Sunday after Sunday to try and convince you of the reasonableness of Christianity, even though I believe Christianity is very reasonable. There are good answers to your questions. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had in my office or privately in someone's home with someone who has reservations. The question why comes up a lot. Why did my parent die so young? Why did my, my mother suffer so much before she died? Why did we have a miscarriage? Why did we have three miscarriages? Why do bad things happen to good people? And I try to remind folks as as gently as I can, even if I had a good foolproof answer to your reservation or your question, it wouldn't change how you feel. You, You wouldn't get your child back. Your marriage will not be restored. We can't go back in time and undo what harmed you or hurt you. You see, it's not about removing the reservations. It's not about solving the problems. It's about buying in in spite of them. Look, let me give you a great example. I want to talk to all the men in the auditorium today who are married. All the married men at Grace Community Church, follow me in my reasoning. Remember all those reasons you had not to get married? Uh, I made a list. I'm not giving up my freedom. If you think some woman is going to tell me what time to get home, you've got another thing coming. My freedom is too valuable to me. I do what I want, when I want, no questions asked. Here's another one. I don't like the sound of commitment. Who am I at 26 to think I can make a lifelong commitment? Life is a very long time I'm not sure I like the sound of that word. Here's a big one, money. It costs a lot of money to get married. It not only costs you money to get married, then you got to give half your money away to your wife. I don't like the sound of that. I don't want to be told no when I want to buy something. Here's another. You looked at other married people and you thought, why would I ever want to get married? Those people look miserable. You picked out that one super unhappy couple who never have anything positive to say to one another, and you fixated on them, and you said, I'm not getting married. Look at them. I'm too young to get married. There's plenty of time for marriage down the road. And one of my favorites is, I don't want to get married because what if I meet somebody better? I mean, haven't you heard? Tom Brady and Giselle are having trouble. What if I meet Giselle? What if she likes me? 
Now, when you got married, did all those go away? When you got married, did they disappear? When you got married, were they all answered? No. What happened? They shrunk dramatically in light of something you wanted even more. No, 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 not sex. Next slide. Love. That's why you got married. You fell in love. Marriage was no longer like an institution or a way of life. Marriage was about a person. It was about Amy, whom I love. It was about Laura. It was about Diane. It was about, it was about someone special to you. It became personal. And ladies, the same goes for you. I mean, think about all the problems you had before you decided to have a baby. Think about all your reservations. Man, if I have a baby, it's dangerous to be pregnant. We all know stories of heartbreak during pregnancy. My body is going to change outrageously. I don't know if I can deal with that. It costs a lot of money to bring a child into this world. Hey, this world is not the greatest place anyway to bring a child into. I'm not sure how I feel about that. If we have a baby... It's going to put a lot more strain on our marriage. Remember all those reservations? But you still had a baby, didn't you? You still got pregnant, didn't you? Why? Because it became about your baby. Not the concept of child rearing. Not the idea of a baby. It was about your baby. Now, your story of faith is very personal to you. Christianity, unlike other world religions, if you study them side by side, is a very personal religion. You see, Christianity is not about a a, a rule or a regulation. It's not about a book. It's not about a movement. It's not about more information. No, it's personal. People buy in when it becomes personal. Now, asking questions is important, and there's nothing wrong with having reservations. As I said, there are plenty of examples of biblical people who had reservations regarding following Jesus Christ. Not every first century Christ follower just jumped on the bandwagon, guns blazing. No. In fact, Jesus welcomes our skepticism. Jesus welcomes our curiosity. Jesus is patient with us. Even the followers of Christ in the first century were skeptical. Saul, whom we're about to read about, was very skeptical at one time. So here's the main idea. I put it in the program. Your story matters. Your story's significant because it's personal to you. You see, that's important because your story doesn't have to look like my story. As people tell their story, you don't have to sit out there and say, what must I be missing because my story doesn't sound like theirs. There is no one-size-fits-all story in the Bible. We're all different. My story is personal to me. Your story is personal to you. Look, and I'll be dreadfully honest with you. I'll be painfully transparent with you. I know followers of Jesus Christ whose story doesn't look like mine at all, and I'll be honest with you, I don't really even like them. (laughs) They're not my kind of people, you see? I was around a man one time who, when he prayed, he did not address God as Father or Heavenly Father. He addressed God as my Jesus. My Jesus, I just want my Jesus this and my Jesus that. You know know what that felt like to me? It felt pretentious. I would never pray that way. Now look, follow me. If you pray like that, fine, more power to you. Because that's personal to you, but it's not to me. You see, there was a time in my life where I wasn't interested in the church because the church seemed feminine to me. You start talking about a personal relationship with Jesus. A lot of men see that as feminine. They hear that as feminine. I felt that way for a long time. I've said for a long time, the church of Jesus Christ in America has been overmothered and it's been underfathered. That's why this church is the way it is. You look around, you see all these men. It's very important to me to convince men, real men, that following Jesus Christ is the 
best decision they'll ever make with their life. But your relationship with Christ does not have to look exactly like my relationship. The goal of this church is not to crank out people, followers of Jesus, who look identical. That's not the goal. Never has been the goal. That's legalism. Paul says we live in in freedom. There is no one-size-fits-all story because yours is personal and mine is personal. In Acts chapter 7, we're introduced to a man named Saul, a man who had no idea that the story of Jesus was about to become personal to him. Saul is one of the most impersonal, hateful, vicious people you would ever meet. It started out as one of those impersonal stories, and then everything changed. It became very, very personal. You see, just months after the resurrection, Rome and the Jewish leaders, they assumed this whole hubbub would die down. It'll just die down and go away, but it didn't. Instead, a massive movement started uh, moving forward. Last time, we called it a resurrection revolution. Eyewitnesses to the resurrection were everywhere. Hundreds of them claiming, I saw the resurrected Christ. That became super unsettling for the Jewish leaders, super unsettling for the Romans. They set out to put down the uprising. They would accuse someone of treason. Then they would hire fake witnesses to stand, take an oath, and lie on the stand so that they could incarcerate, even stone to death, followers of Jesus. One of those victims was a man named Stephen. We're introduced to Stephen in Acts chapter 6. Stephen was the first recorded martyr in the New Testament. He was very charismatic. He was one of the best and most powerful speakers at the synagogue or the temple, and the Jews decided to, to shut him down. During the stoning of Stephen, the witnesses came in and laid their coats in the back. And standing by those coats is a man we're about to meet named Saul. Look at Acts 7 and look at the end of verse 58. Meanwhile, the witnesses, the witnesses who testified falsely against Stephen, laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is where we first meet Saul. He looks on with great approval, I might add, according to the last verse, of chapter 7, as Stephen is stoned. Skip up to chapter 8 and verse 1. On that day, the day Stephen died, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. So it's open season on followers of Jesus. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Verse 2, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. He used every tool at his disposal. He used all of his power, all of his resources, all of his authority to exterminate followers of Jesus. Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women, and then he put them in prison. Now, turn over two pages to Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Saul was a vicious human being. Saul was responsible for the capture, the torture, the the, the suffering, the torture of these people to get them to recant their faith. He looked on as they were tortured, and he did so taking great pride in his work. He's breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So he's not satisfied exterminating Christianity within Jerusalem. He wants to expand his authority, increase his power to go to surrounding communities and round up followers of Jesus and put them to death. Verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Up until this point, Saul had been persecuting an it. Now he finds out it's a me. Up until this point, Saul is persecuting a movement. Now he realizes it's a person. It's getting personal for Saul. Who are you, Lord? Verse 5, great question. Who are you, Lord? Let me ask you, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus Christ to you? 
You see, how you answer that question is very personal to you, isn't it? That's when it becomes real. That's when it becomes authentic. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. Now it's personal for Saul. He's met Jesus. He replied, verse 6, now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Beginning in verse 7 down through verse 14, God instru- or Jesus instructs Saul to go find a man named Ananias. Saul is struck blind by that flash of light and Ananias is going to help him. Well, when Ananias meets him, Ananias doesn't trust him because he's heard of Saul's reputation. Saul was a vicious murdering killer. But the funny thing is, were it not for the story of Saul, we probably never would have heard of Ananias. Ananias' story is every bit as personal to him as Saul's is to him. Look at verse 15, Acts chapter 9. But the Lord then said to Ananias, after Ananias you know, says, well, I'm not sure I want to do this. I don't know if I want to get involved with this guy. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. Skip down to the end of verse 19. Saul spent several days with his disciples in, or with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. <laughs> Wait a minute. We're talking about in just days, a matter of days, this guy's gone from the greatest persecutor of the church to the most prolific mouthpiece of the church. In just a matter of days, we would have looked at Saul and said, whoa, 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 slow down, man. Slow down. You know what he would have said to us? He would have said, look, I didn't have all my questions answered. I'm still processing what happened to me on the road to Damascus. I haven't put all the pieces together yet. I haven't figured it all out. But this one thing I know, I met Jesus. And that's when it became personal. That's when it became real. He began to preach, verse 21. All those who heard him were astonished, and they asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah. Look, your story is personal to you. My story is personal to me. It's unique to you. It's unique to me. Saul's story is one of the most unique in all of the Bible, but we do have some things that we share in common with Saul. I made a list. Number one, he believed that he was right. And before I met Jesus, I believed I was right. Most all the time. The God of rightness is a deceitful little counterfeit God. I call it self-sovereignty. I'm smarter than you, and I know it. Deep down, if you're honest, you know it too, right? That's Saul. That's Saul. Saul believed he was right. Confronting his own personal sin was something he wasn't interested in. The world may be filled with sinners, but I'm really not a sinner. I'm like a mistaker, right? I mean, nobody's perfect. I make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes, but I'm better than most people. Isn't that how you felt before you came face to face with your sin and your need for a savior? Saul did. Here's another one. His allegiance was to himself. I can relate to that. Self-preservation. Expand self. Self's power, influence, self's possessions. Before Jesus or Saul met Jesus, Saul's allegiance was primarily to himself. That's what drives far too many people today. As we stand back and watch others live, it's easy to come to the conclusion that, man, all they care about is money. Man, all they care about is expanding their influence, building their kingdom. Here's another thing. Saul's motivation changed. So did mine. What a transformation. I mean, this is a story of real transformation. This is like 180 degrees from evil to apostle. Saul's story is one of real life change. Well, so is mine. Maybe not that dramatic, but it's personal to me. What drove me, what motivated me prior to Christ is not nearly as powerful in my life as it once was. And then finally, it became personal. See, a lot of people sit in church 
and they hear about a plan. They hear about a religious plan, a religious organization. They think it's all about a book, a series of rules, regulations. But listen to me, those are it's. Those are it's. Jesus is a who. See? And that matters. When the historical Jesus becomes somebody you respond to, you can relate to, that's when everything changes. That's when your faith comes alive. Why? Because it just got personal. A personal relationship with Christ doesn't begin by answering all your questions or solving all your problems, removing all the obstacles. There's absolutely nothing personal about that. It begins with relationship. That's when it gets personal. A personal relationship with God magnifies God while minimizing our reservations. A personal relationship with God overpowers my fear by altering my perspective. A personal relationship with God enhances the routine of life by refreshing our spirit. And if you've experienced it, you know how true it really is. You see, God wants to include you in his eternal story. And think about this. If God can use a man like this, Saul, imagine what he could do with us. Let's pray. Father, I am so very thankful that my story has been a small part of your story for a very long time. And like Laura said, and like Brian said in the first service, thank you for what you've done in me and through me. And Father, while we all would say we have such a long way to go, so many things we'd like to do better, things we'd like to overcome, thank you that you love us. And that love is unconditional. It never changes. So, Father, help all of us recognize that our significance is in you, not ourselves. Meaning in this life is found in your story, not our feeble attempts to write our own. May all of us this day give just a little bit more of our lives to you, our intention to you, as you continue to so eloquently author our stories. I pray it in Christ's name with respect and thanksgiving. Amen. God bless you, Grace Community Church. Hope you make it a fantastic week. I will see you next time.